In verse 14, after Pentecost, remember when the Spirit had been poured out? And many wondered as there were those speaking in tongues and some wondered if they were drunk and others wondered what was happening and yet all were hearing in their own tongue. And it says this in verse 14 of Acts and chapter 2. But Peter taking his stand with the eleven raised his voice and declared to the men of Judah and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give heed to my words, for these men are not drunk as you suppose. For it is only the third hour of the day, but this is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. And it shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour forth my spirit on all mankind and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my bond slaves, both men and women, I will in those days pour forth my spirit and they shall prophesy. I will grant wonders in the sky above and signs on the earth below. Blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord shall come. And it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. He then says this in verse 22. Men of Israel, Listen to these words, Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders, signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. This man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. But God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. For David says of him, I saw the Lord always in my presence, for he is at my right hand, so that I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue exalted. Moreover, my flesh also will not uh, will live in hope because you will not abandon my soul, nor allow your Holy One to undergo decay. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. What great words. Peter was proclaiming something he knew very well. And that was this, that as he spoke to those, as the presence of God was poured out, He quotes David and says, I saw the Lord always in my presence. If you've seen the Lord, the resurrected Lord, it leads to a life that cannot be the same. It is changing. It changes everything. And I love the fact that this morning as we read these words, they're coming from no one less than the voice of Peter himself. That voice of Peter is the one who just days earlier had doubted. He doubted. He was the one who denied Christ three times before the cock would crow. And yet now, this Peter, one who I've told you, my favorite character in Scripture, because again, he was all over the map and he managed to always seem to speak before thinking. He was able to put one foot in his mouth and find plenty of room for the other more often than not. And yet now on Pentecost, who's the one who boldly stands and declares? It's Peter. It's the same Peter. The same Peter we've always known, but something's different. That same Peter has been filled with a different person. The person is Jesus himself. The Spirit of Christ is upon him. And now Peter, the same Peter, filled with a different person, is going to be, fulfill, and now Proclaim the role. What did Jesus say when he met him? Simon Peter. You will be known, right? Simon as Peter, Petros, a rock. Peter was never a rock. 
but one day he would find that point in place where he would know the rock who would redeem him and live in him. I love that David himself said this, I saw the Lord always in my presence. You see, after Peter saw the risen Lord, it changed everything. Because Jesus, as we read, put to death, could not be held. These godless men put him to death, but God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. You know what's beautiful? As we move on into Acts chapter 3, as Peter stands up a second time, listen to what he says after they healed a lame beggar. He says this, while he was clinging to Peter, John, all the people ran together to them, at the so-called portico of Solomon, full of amazement. But when Peter saw this, he replied to the people, Men of Israel, why are you amazed at this? Or why do you gaze at us as if by our own power or piety we had made him walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the God of our fathers has glorified his servant Jesus, the one whom you delivered, disowned in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you disowned the holy and righteous one, asked for a murderer to be granted to you, and put to death the prince of life, the one whom God raised from the dead, a fact to which we are witnesses." And on the basis of faith in his name, it is the name of Jesus, which has strengthened this man whom you see and know. And the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect help in the presence of you all. Brethren, I know that you acted in ignorance, just as your rulers did also. But the things which God announced beforehand by the mouth of all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer, He has thus fulfilled. Repent, return, so that your sins may be wiped away. You know what's beautiful? The fact that Peter had come to a place after he had tried so hard, so many times. Remember his promise to Jesus? (laughs) I will die (laughs) at your side. I won't leave you. I won't deny you. He had tried so much in so many times, and yet now, notice what he says. Why are you amazed? Do you gaze at us if by our own power or piety we made this man walk? What did Peter come to realize? It wasn't within his grasp, power, or piety to do any of it. But it was all found in Christ. And this morning, if there are any verses of encouragement for us, I want to remind you of this. In Romans 6, listen, do you not know that all of us who've been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we've been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we might walk in the newness of life. For if we've become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing that this, our old self, was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. Now, if we've died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ has been raised from the dead is never to die again. Death no longer master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. You see, I find so often I can settle for death, but the death is only to lead us to the life. Jesus did not come to simply show the way. 
to provide an example for the way. He came to be the way. Live the life that we cannot. But we find, and again, those key words, if you've been baptized into his death and buried with him, it's put this way in Galatians 2 and verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ, so it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live, I live in the flesh by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. I've been crucified with Christ. The old, the old man, the old efforts, the old promises. How many times do we rededicate ourselves to Jesus? I'll do better. I'll pray more. I'll devote more. I'll go to church more. I will sing more. At Pentecost, Peter had finally come to a point in place where he realized his lack of power to do any of it. And it had nothing to do with his power or his piety, his commitment, his dedication. It had everything to do with Jesus who is going to live that life and now with his spirit present in him. It was Jesus who could do what he could not. It was Jesus who was the rock that he longed to be from the beginning. Paul puts it this way in 2 Timothy 2, For this reason I endure all things for the sake of those who are chosen, so that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus, And with it, eternal glory. It is a trustworthy statement. If we died with him, we will also live with him. This Easter, I ask you the question. Have you been so consumed with your commitment, your dedication, your service, your own piety and power to live a righteous, religious life, Have you come to the place where you've been crucified with Christ and died to it all? Realized your inability to be it at all? Because we have to navigate the death before we can enjoy the life. You have to realize what you are before you can give birth to what God desires you to be. True life always requires a death. That's why Jesus said, a grain of wheat falls to the ground and must die before what? It grows and bears much fruit. We are simply seeds to be planted. And today, before we can understand the life, we must know the death. I've been crucified with Christ. We call it Good Friday, not because the suffering, the punishment, the death, the dying was good. Jesus had been handed over, as we just read, to evil men, misguided, misdirected in their attempts at righteousness and salvation. And yet it was good because it was necessary that he must suffer on our behalf so that we might know his life. To the Philippians, Paul writes this, according to my earnest expectation and hope that I will not be put to shame in anything, but that with all boldness, Christ will even now, as always, be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For me to live is Christ, And to die is gain. To live is Christ. Today on this resurrection morning, have you seen Jesus? The risen Jesus. Not the Jesus on the cross. Not the Jesus in the grave. 
Not the pictures of Jesus, the beaten, the persecuted. Have you seen the risen Jesus? The Jesus who today indwells, who equips, who empowers, who takes the Peters of this world, (laughs) jumping out of boats only to sink, (laughs) shouting out, you're the son of God, well done, only to say, over my dead body, you don't need to suffer, get behind me, Satan, (laughs) only to say, I won't let you down, Lord, I'll be with you to the end, only to say, I don't know him three times. Peter was absolutely crushed. But he came to the end of himself. He came to the end of his efforts. He came to the end of his willpower. He came to the end of his righteous promises to Jesus. And at the end he found, he couldn't keep it. But when we begin to read the book of Acts, what's changed? Now the Spirit of God is within him. The voice of God welling up through him. He's now known the death of it all because it had nothing to do with his piety or power and everything to do with the presence of a risen Lord. I've often said to you on these Easter Sunday mornings, as we remember, as they recount in scriptures, how they ran to the grave only to see a rock rolled away and an empty tomb. How many of us today, daily, in each and every situation, go looking for a dead Jesus? One who had paid the price, but then left us to lead our own lives, however righteously we can, on his behalf. So often, That's what I, I might not say it with my mouth, but I do it with my actions. It's as though he weren't here. Oh, I'm thankful that the price and the penalty were paid. But how often do I enter a situation running, expecting a living Lord to be there? He had already told them, on the third day I'll rise. They should have been running in anticipation to what? Glory. And yet in their minds, they still didn't get it. And I'll tell you what, there are days in which I don't either. (laughs) Because I fail to apply what I know. He's alive. He's alive and well. And today, he has me. Despite all my failures, all my weakness, All my problems, there is a good God. And it's at the end that I find the beginning. It's when I realize that I have been crucified with Christ and in the likeness of his death, leaving it all to the Lord, I can now begin to understand what it means to walk in the likeness of his life. Today, if your Christian walk can still be defined by your devotion, your prayer life, the amount of time you spend thinking about God, singing to God, spending time practicing service for God, then you might continue to know the name of Jesus, But perhaps you haven't met the risen Jesus. The Jesus who takes the broken, the crucified, yes, even the one on the cross next to him. And while one was spitting insults, the other saying what? Lord, I need you. And tomorrow you'll be with me in paradise. You see, when I get to the end, I find the beginning of the risen Lord. When you begin to realize, as Peter did, that the Christian life wasn't just hard, it was impossible. 
It was impossible. But it was something only made possible by the life of Jesus. A life that now lives, not beside you, our common example, right? Is Jesus in the back seat or the front passenger seat? Shouldn't be in any seat, but the driver's seat, right? Today, today, if you know the Lord, it's his life in you that matters. Not to just follow an example. What would Jesus do? But a divine life within, welling up in you, what he will do. Because he's enough for what you can't do. And today I hope that as we go through a season in which, as Good Friday brought us the beginning, crucified with Christ so that we might know the likeness of the life. May we go out these doors expecting the living, not something to see externally, but something welling up internally from the depth of our being. Listening, trusting, and knowing his empowering. That's the beauty. But I want to remind you, That as you read on in the scriptures, and we won't turn there for time's sake, was Peter perfect from that day forward? No. Even Paul had to call him out. Why? Because at some point he subtly sat back and started to treat Jews and Gentiles a little differently. And when they're both in the room, he began to act a little different. And Paul says, I had to call him out to his face. You see, the Lord is alive. But as we press on, we are learning to daily depend on that life. Not on the old voice, not on the old manner, not on the old power and the old piety, but in the newness of his life. And this God speaks as a lamp unto our feet, if only we're listening, available and ready at his command. I love how Paul ends those verses we just read in Philippians. Because this morning, as I mentioned, I'm going to be going in for a bit of a complicated surgery, hoping to come out with a few uh, spare parts removed that the Lord decided I didn't need anyway. But Paul says this. He says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But he says, but if I am to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me. And do I not know which to choose, but I am hard pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is very much better. Yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you for all your progress and joy in the faith, so that your proud confidence may abound in Christ through my coming to you again. What a great reminder that today, The Lord is good, and the Lord has us, and there was a longing to be with Christ, and yet to be with them also, that together, united in faith, we might know the Lord all the more. 